Many thanks, Stephanie, for getting us off to a nice start. Um, we're just starting spring, all of us collectively, and I think the um, the bringing of coaching skills and relationships into healthcare feels like spring, feel, feels like fresh growth. So let's kind of live into that energy today. Um, when I put together this month's coaching report, I started with an article in the New England Journal of Medicine just out called The Doctor's New Dilemma. And Suzanne Coven closed the article, and I hope you read it. Then I sit at my workstation to document and bill for our encounter, perched at the edge of my seat on the verge of despair. And the reason for this despair is the uh, loss of relationships with patients that physicians are finding themselves experiencing for many, many reasons. Um, so today we wanted to present some hope. Um, and we've got with us three uh, incredible physicians um, who bring three quite different perspectives um, to the topic of uh, bringing back the relationship in healthcare via the soul and spirit and competencies of coaches. So we're going to start with Beth Frades, who uh, is a um, physical rehab um, doc, an author. Um, she is a teacher. She teaches at Harvard Medical School. Um, she's become a coach and has uh, been for many years sitting at that, uh, that um, boundary of coaching and medicine and doing it beautifully. Um, then we have Radhika Kakarala, who's here from uh, Flint, Michigan. And Radhika is an internist and a professor at Michigan State. She teaches um, internists. And she completed coach training and has been using it in her own practice, teaching her residents, and, and now starting a, a professional coaching practice. And then Eddie Phillips will close. And Eddie, um, in fact, Eddie and Beth are uh, close collaborators. They're both physical rehab uh, doctors at Harvard. And, um, and Eddie started the Institute of Lifestyle Medicine. Some of you may have been to his conferences um, at Harvard. It's been going a number of years. And it turns out now lifestyle medicine is becoming um, somewhat of a trend. Uh, and the marriage of coaching and lifestyle medicine, and I should say Beth also teaches lifestyle medicine, um, is, uh, is a way to think about um, expanding the impact of um, physicians and coaching. So with that, um, each of our presenters are going to run their own slides. And so um, we'll be turning over the, um, the, the, the steering wheel. Um, and Beth's slides, Beth, you're, you're ready to go. And then there will be a quick handover between um, the other two. Uh, we're hoping to have this, the uh, presentation go for a, an hour. And uh, we'll uh, reserve the last 15 minutes for questions. Um, please enter your questions, as Stephanie mentioned. We'd love to have some real juicy, interesting questions. So please let us know. And if we can't get to all of them today, we'll make sure that we cover them one way or another. So with that, a warm welcome um, to Beth Frades. Thank you so much, Margaret and Stephanie. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be participating in this webinar on physicians, coaching, and lifestyle medicine. I'm passionate about both coaching and lifestyle medicine, and it's a real honor to be part of this panel for the IOC. At the Institute of Coaching Conference in September, our track on lifestyle medicine and coaching reviewed the synergy between these two areas, noting that physicians can gain a great deal by working with coaches and coaches can also benefit from partnering with physicians. Together they have a symbiotic relationship which can help propel patients further along to their optimal state of health and wellness. They really have mutual goals and often different strengths and, and different training that when combined can work in synergy with powerful effects. Given our burden of chronic disease related to unhealthy lifestyles in the U.S. and worldwide, we're really starving for effective solutions for self-management and empowerment that improve the well-being of patients, that reduce the morbidity and mortality of chronic disease like diabetes, cardiac disease, stroke, 
and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, as well as reduce the cost of health care. With the greater demands on our time and the increased stress levels experienced by healthcare workers and patients alike, we're all longing for an antidote to this stress. That's not a pill. The combined of efforts of health and wellness coaches and lifestyle medicine practitioners might well be the combination of efforts that can help cure the chronic diseases and the conditions that are killing us. During the September conference, we reviewed the state of the literature on health coaching and discussed many of the randomized controlled studies that revealed health coaching interventions were more effective than usual care for lowering cholesterol levels, lowering hemoglobin A1C levels, reducing asthma readmission rates to hospitals in pediatric patients, and also reducing cancer pain levels. There's actually been enough randomized controlled trials performed at this point to warrant publication of systematic reviews of health coaching and well, a health, coach, health and wellness coaching and outcomes in healthcare. These review studies confirm the effectiveness of health and wellness coaching. Today I'm going to share some recent research that wasn't covered in September that shows that health and wellness coaching is continuing to make gains and is being acknowledged as valuable in even more areas of health care, as we'll see. I like to look at health and wellness coaching and lifestyle medicine as this beautiful bouquet that I've represented in this slide in the picture. And the bouquet is the reducing of mor morbidity and mortality from chronic disease and increasing overall well-being. And it's going to take a number of flowers to make that happen in the U.S. and worldwide. Let's dive in now into one of the studies I wanted to review with you guys today. Diabetes has been a hot topic in the U.S. as we have a diabetes and obesity epidemic. And health and wellness coaching for many years has been used and studied to reduce hemoglobin A1C levels as well as increase self-management. As you know, physicians and, well, especially insurance companies are very interested in hemoglobin A1C and objective lab values such as that. So this particular review study that was recently published in February of this year shows us that there have been enough randomized controlled trials in the area of diabetes that warrant a review of randomized controlled trials. And in this particular publication, they found eight randomized controlled trials to evaluate and the pooled effect of health coaching overall was statistically significant, especially in the area of reducing hemoglobin A1C, which was their primary outcome of their review. The health coaching review showed health coaching can reduce hemoglobin A1C levels uh, overall average of 0.32. When compared to controls, controls were actually, the control intervention was keeping hemoglobin A1C steady, no change, increasing the hemoglobin A1C levels in some studies, and only revealing slight change in hemoglobin A1C, meaning 0 0.004 change or a 0.1 change or a 0 0.05 change. So this is great news in that we now have demonstrated that health and wellness coaching looked at over the years, they looked at a 2010 study all the way to 2014 and found these eight trials and show that it is a, a very effective, viable option for reducing hemoglobin A1C. What I really like about the study that I find encouraging, is the longer the health coaching intervention went, the better the results, meaning the greater the reduction in the hemoglobin A1C, such that if you look at the values from those interventions that 
provided health coaching over six months, the drop in hemoglobin A1C was actually closer to 0 0.5, uh, 0.57 in fact. And that sounds maybe to you like a small number, but what research has shown is if you can drop hemoglobin A1C by 0 0.5, you're actually dropping glucose levels by approximately 15 points, which is significant um, for the life uh, and health of a diabetic patient. Another important point to mention about this review is they looked at what did the health coaching interventions consist of. And it was goal setting, knowledge acquisition, individualized care, and frequent follow-up. This was noted also, these similar aspects of health coaching in the Williver and colleague review that was published in Global Advances a couple of years ago. The next study I want to draw your attention to is one on a topic that had not been really highlighted in the health coaching literature previously, and it was just published a couple of weeks ago um, in March, and it's on chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which costs us, the U.S., a significant amount each year due to hospitalizations. So this study looked at how health coaching could diminish rehospitalization rates. And they found, compared to control, significant reductions at month one, three, six, and nine uh, in this intervention. The, the intervention, when looked at after a year, 12 months was not as significantly um, reduced. And that is primarily due, in my view and evaluation of literature in this study, because the intervention was heavy in the beginning of the intervention, meaning the first three months, people were having health coaching telephone sessions once a week, and then that turned to once a month. So one of the things to look at is the intensity of the intervention. This is very promising, though, in that health coaching can be utilized in COPD, with good results. Interestingly, they also talked about putting in physical activity. So they gave these patients ellipticals and said, asked them to use them 20 minutes a day. Interestingly, no one really listened to that particular piece of advice, but one would wonder, do these people like ellipticals? Did they want to use an elliptical? And that part of the, the intervention was not really detailed. Now, looking at coaching in a different view, looking at it in terms of coaching the family practitioner, the family doctor, as to how to improve their clinical ability so that they can help and empower their patients to reduce their hemoglobin A1Cs. So this study actually worked to coach the family doctors. And the intervention was successful in building skills for the family doctors. And they worked on experiential learning and goal setting. And in fact, those family doctors that underwent the coaching intervention, their patients were more likely to reduce their fasting glucose levels as compared to the control group. They did not experience any of the coaching intervention. Um, I would love to dive into some of my own work um, in this area. And one of the things we've been interested in is what is the synergy between the coach and the physician, uh, and how does one have a lifestyle medicine practice? There's a lot of different ways to do this, and, and Dr. Chris Kent in Naples has put together a team of health coach, lifestyle medicine practitioner, physical therapist, and licensed nutritionist, and pulled together three or four, actually, of his, of his patients and has uh, published the data in the American Journal of Lifestyle Medicine, which was just published this week. And it does describe how the coach 
can work in synergy with the physician and a physical therapist and a nutritionist to create this lifestyle medicine team to reduce weight and cholesterol levels, which were the focus of his intervention. I myself have been working as a coach and lifestyle medicine uh, practitioner for a few years now and have had my own clients and experiences to share. And the BMJ, British Medical Journal, did publish a case report of mine just recently in Paving the Path to Wellness about utilizing health coaching skills and lifestyle medicine to allow patients to achieve sustainable change. And the patient that I present, uh, we followed over two years or more, and she has been able to hold her weight and healthy habits both steady for that period of time. What I'm working on now, I'm very excited about because it's a, a group lifestyle medicine intervention. Um, and it's a pilot intervention at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital here in Boston. The seeds of the study were many years ago, I, I think it's now four years ago, when I just worked uh, with uh, three or four stroke survivors and their caregivers, and we did a four-week intervention in, in really health coach and stroke prevention skill building. And we did publish that in Global Ad Advances. From, from there, I developed, further developed the program of lifestyle medicine and coaching, and we are piloting the larger, expansive version of that uh, this year. It will end in June. We started in, uh, in June 2015. And what we're doing is taking stroke survivors and their caregivers, bringing them together twice a month, the first and second Thursday of every month we meet for an hour and a half. And we do have some educational aspects to the program where we do talk about physical activity, nutrition, stress reduction, connection, and sleep. But we allow it to be a discussion and we encourage the participants to actually help each other when obstacles appear. And there's a heavily, um, I would say the emphasis in the first session of the month is on information and discussion and then the next section, session is really on practice and it's activity based. We'll practice the physical activity or if it's nutrition, we'll work with the chefs at, at Spalding Rehab and create together a nutritious meal or if it's stress reduction, we'll practice mindfulness based stress reduction together in that um, that session. So it's really been a combination um, each week of, uh, of sharing information. Uh, I as the leader share some information uh, but try and foster this group coaching environment. And, and we did do a, a mid-year evaluation for the patients and the caregivers and we did find significant findings in terms of their connection, their joy, their weight loss, lowered blood pressure, increased confidence, vegetable uh, intake was increased and increased physical activity. So it's very promising and I am really looking forward to continuing that research um, next year. Actually, we'll start again in a larger, a larger trial. What I've realized since really beginning this journey in 2008 with health coaching and lifestyle medicine is it really is teamwork. Um, it's going to take the health coach, it's going to take the lifestyle medicine practitioner, the patient. We're all part of the same team striving to reduce morbidity and mortality from chronic disease as well as striving to improve our own well-beings. So I hope that is helpful to you all, and I look forward to hearing the other panelists and seeing how we can synergize and, and provide you with some useful information. Thank you. Um, thank you, Beth, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I, I met, I first uh, had listened to Beth's talk three years ago when I went to lifestyle medicine and that was the game changer for me. 
Uh, my talk is titled Wellness, a Transformative Choice. And uh, the first thing that I did when I attended to that, uh, when I attended the Lifestyle Medicine Conference was I wanted to transform the way I was practicing medicine because I was getting weighed down by working harder than my patients in keeping them healthy. When I heard Beth's talk about coaching, that was the missing part of the puzzle for me and I got trained as a health and wellness coach and started using those techniques in my own patients. So the objective of my talk today is to share my experience and outcomes of using coaching skills instead of counseling skills, not only with my patients, but also uh, with my residence patients. I am a preceptor for uh, my residence clinics in two settings, in, the, um, in their own private practice, as well as seeing patients in the free clinic where the resources are extremely limited. And then I'd like to share with you how that's translating for the residence education by sharing with you the reflections of my residents. So when I look at the health and wellness coaching paradigm, um, my focus up until two years ago was always in the top half of this pie. I used to focus on making sure that my patients had very low illness or at least preventing them from having high illness. Uh, and they did have it for a while, some of it due to my efforts, some of it due to their efforts, but as age and life caught up with them, they started to develop more and more medical problems, as we know, like diabetes, hypertension, etc. Now that I'm a health and I'm a well, I've switched from the role of an illness doctor to a wellness doctor, so my focus is now in the second half of this pie chart. I, regardless of how many illnesses my patients have, I now try to help them understand the difference between illness and wellness and make sure at any given point in their illness that they're still well enough to have some quality of life that they choose. Um, this shows the difference between uh, when I was using the coaching technique, uh, counseling technique where it was more a top-down approach. I was telling them they need to quit smoking. I was telling them they need to eat less, move more, lose weight. So my efforts were really significantly more than the patient wellness. For my effort, I was not getting the results that I wanted in their wellness. Um, I recently read a very beautiful book um, by Dr. Ofrey. It's called How Doctors Feel. And she states, states in there that it's important for us to know about the person that has the illness and not just about the illness that the person has. And I think that summarizes the difference between my approach when I use counseling technique versus coaching technique. So this is how my practice is right now and how my career satisfaction is. I, with very little effort, my patient's wellness is increasing because I'm getting to know the person that has the disease. I also understood the power of exploring the unmet needs behind my patients' unhealthy habits. Before, I just used to tell them that they need to stop doing that unhealthy habit, otherwise they'll get all these negative consequences. But there's a lot of universal needs that people have unmet, like relaxation, a sense of belonging or connection with others, social media, um, so they turn towards social media for things like that, or they're not happy, so they turn towards serotonin releasing foods, stress that can come from lack of purpose, from being in a career that's not satisfied, and many physicians are experiencing burnout because of this. Now I'm learning to ask open-ended questions and active listening. So I'll just give an example of a patient. Um, this was a resident's patient. The resident came and presented the history and told me, Dr. Kakrala, this is a non-compliant patient. He's missed several appointments. His blood pressure is uncontrolled. He uses cocaine and so on and so forth. So you could see that the resident was clearly frustrated. But as I um, reviewed the chart, I noticed that the patient has lost some weight over the last three to four uh, months. So I asked the resident about it, have you 
I noticed that and he said, yeah, he did say he's exercising a little bit more, but he sort of said that in passing. So when I went in with the patient, I first acknowledged his efforts and then I told him, I'm not here to preach and teach you that you should quit uh, using cocaine. I know you already know that, but I'm just curious, what needs does cocaine fill for you? And there was dead silence in the room. I, and we all are uncomfortable with silence, but one of the things I learned through coaching is that you got to get comfortable with coaching, uh, with silence. So after a few seconds, the patient told me, you know, I never really thought about it, but I think it's because I, I have bipolar disorder, so when I go into the depressive phase of it, cocaine is the one thing that can get me out of that quickly. And it just blew me away. I never even gave that a thought. So then the remaining question started. Can you think of what you might have done in the past that made you feel happy? And then after reflection, he told me he used to write stories before and he stopped doing that many years ago. He was a painter, he stopped doing that. And then why might you want to stop using cocaine? Well, because my grandkids, I have grandkids now, so I want to be around unhealthy to see them. What, if anything, about your lifestyle are you willing to change? And so um, finally, at the end of the visit, what he said was, he asked me to give him a piece of paper and he wrote it down. When you feel down, make sure you have things handy to either write a story or paint. And then I asked him, when would you like to come back so we can follow up on your goals? And they know. They, he said, I'll be back in one month. So that was the resident, you could see, it was a real eye-opener for him um, to see the transformation in the patient from a non-compliant patient to somebody that he understood, that felt understood. So now when I use the coaching techniques, my patients are, they know what their unmet needs are, first of all, and they're choosing healthy habits to uh, meet their unmet needs, but it's their health their habits, not what I want for them, but it's something that has worked for them in the past or something that they might want to explore. So many of them meditate now for relaxation. I meditate with my patients in the clinic for two minutes so that they have an idea what it feels like. They are, um, especially the older ones, they're realizing the power of volunteering and becoming part of the communities. So that's making them feel better. And there are several patients that are learning to take risks outside their comfort zone and either exploring alternative careers or doing some things that they've always wanted to do but never really had the courage to do it. Sorry. So what do the residents feel about it? I know I feel really good about the process of coaching. I know it was a game changer for me, and I know this is something I will continue to use with my in my interactions with my own patients and with my residents, but how did they perceive this? Um, the first reflection is from my uh, resident, who's a second year resident, and he said, I've noticed that when we coach our patients, um, they they make, it makes them feel like they're in the driver's seat. They take an active role in their health, they feel empowered, and have more confidence in them to make lifestyle changes to improve their health. A third year resident who's going to graduate in a few months and will be going on to do pulmonary and critical care fellowship, he shared with me that he believes that he needed this experience before he graduated because quote unquote, I believe in the concept that medicine is really beyond just medicine. It's also about building the good relationship with the patients and having the skills to communicate with the patients in the way that makes them take charge of their own health. As a matter of fact, I feel more relieved by doing that because my patients are well taken care of with less effort from my side. So this picture to me signifies what Margaret said about spring. This to me, learning coaching and um, using those skills with my patients really was like a new beginning to me in my career. I was really at the point where I thought, this is so not worth it. Um, 
this is way too stressful uh, because I'm, I'm not able to make a difference in these people. So I um, just wanted to share, share my experience with you and let you know if there are any listeners in there that are primary care physicians or physicians who feel like uh, it's getting overwhelming. I'd be happy to um, support you through this or she ask in, uh, she answer any questions you might have towards the end. Um, but now I'd like to turn it over to Eddie. Can you see my screen? I'm going to get started. So this is Eddie Phillips. Um, so I wanted to reflect back and give you some sort of updates and reasons for hope, which is what Margaret alluded to very early in the uh, description of what we're talking about today. Uh, just this week in the Wall Street Journal, there was an article about learning hope, uh, that it can be taught. And what's interesting is that it requires what they call agency, which, uh, which means that in order to make the changes that we need to do to see a world in which coaching is mainstream, in which lifestyle medicine is the predominant way that we're practicing in a sustainable way, um, that we need to have the tools and we need to have sort of uh, support along the way that we're heading the right way. Um, so that was earlier this week. And then just between yesterday and today, uh, this morning in the New York Times, there's a very significant announcement about the Obama uh, supporting through the Affordable Care Act, uh, which is now over just at the sixth anniversary of it, and a, a, a huge expansion of the diabetes prevention program. Um, there was uh, written into the Affordable Care Act is money that can be allocated when there's proven efficacy that patients are getting healthier and that they're saving money. And in fact, they showed in a large study, a $12 million study, that each patient diabetic that went through the diabetes prevention program, which of course includes the lifestyle code, saved, uh, saved $2,650. And that more than covered the cost of the coaching. Along the way, the, the patients lost 5% of their, their body weight. Um, the services were provided by coaches, both either online or in person. So this is just literally in the last few days what we're hearing about. I think we need to mute their line. Um, so this is me. Uh, Margaret introduced me before. And uh, significant to this also and sort of colored in my comments is my new role as uh, Chief of Physical Medicine and Rehab at the Boston VA. And what drew me over here is actually a system-wide interest in what they call whole health. Uh, they've trained hundreds of coaches within the VA, which is the nation's largest healthcare system, treating uh, six million active uh, uh, members or vets that, that are qualified to be treated here. It's a $60 billion system, and they're using coaching as well, and I'd like to help move that along. Um, I wrote a book along the way, which I will talk about. So in my few minutes here, I'd like to talk about, just mention my background and training and sort of the way I consume coaching services and coaching psychology, and just give you a little case vignette and a few ideas about if you're approaching doctors, kind of the buzzwords that they're going to be listening for when you say, hey, um, I'm a, a wellness coach, a health coach, and I think that we could be working together. Um, as Margaret mentioned before, both Beth and I are specialists in physical medicine and rehab, and part and parcel of our practice is that there are patients that end up in rehab, and they were not necessarily expecting to be there before they had whatever accident it was, or stroke, or lost their leg, or broke their back. Um, so early, well, back in around 2000, um, I wrote uh, an article about how do you motivate patients to do rehabilitation. So I started getting interested in rehab. And then that generalized to a bigger question of, well, it's not just rehab. There's a limited number of people, thankfully, on active rehab units. But the whole population should be exercising. Asking the question of exercise is so damn good, why don't more people do it? I started delving into sort of the physiology of exercise which I had not learned well in medical school, and came to discover that it's not sort of lack of knowledge on the part of individuals. Uh, if you ask people, they, are, they know that they should be exercising, but 
how do we get them to actually do it? How do you motivate them? And just a, a moment of disclosure, I'm on a bike desk, so if I'm a little bit out of breath, it's both because I'm pedaling and also excited to talk to you guys. Um, so in 2007 and 8, put together and co-authored the American College of Sports Medicine's Exercises Medicine. And I'm showing you the book just to remind me to tell you that as we wrote the book, we looked at the physiology of exercise, but a full third to maybe 40% of the book is all about motivation and all about what coaching skills can we ask um, the average clinician to use. It's not just physicians, it's all clinicians. And what could they do and how can they say it in order to engage the patient to lead to a negotiation, which then comes out looking like an exercise prescription, which you see on the cover here. And it's, of course, tailored to the individual patient. Um, around that same time, uh, with, with help from Beth here at Harvard, we put together the Institute of Lifestyle Medicine, and we came to recognize that the clinicians, physicians, nurses, et cetera, who need to make these changes in order to practice lifestyle medicine, we had to look at them as a group and provide knowledge to them. Doctors and nurses are pretty good at learning things. We can teach you what you know, need to know about exercise in probably a few hours, or we do it over a weekend here. We can give you tools, such as an exercise prescription. You can advise people to use Fitbits and other uh, devices. We can attend to your self-care. I'll skip to the bottom there, because the healthier your clinician is, the more likely you're going to receive information from them and encouragement to do as they do, to eat well, to sleep well, to not overeat, to stay active. But even if we got a generation of lifestyle medicine type trained doctors and nurses who were walking the walk, who knew all about exercise and nutrition, who had the tools, how do you deliver the message? And that's the skills. And that's where I wrote on the bottom that lifestyle medicine clinicians, actually all clinicians, as you heard from Radhika, um, should be and are great consumers of coaching psychology, especially when you add in that it's going to make their lives their professional lives less stressful. Um, even their personal lives are helped. Um, I remember years ago uh, attending a little focus group um, at an American College of Sports Medicine meeting for coaches, and one woman very excitedly said, I qualified as a coach. I haven't, you know, it's changed my life, but I haven't even seen a, a single client yet. And everyone leaned forward like, what? Like, you did the coaching, I got that. You haven't seen anyone, how has it changed your life? And, she said very excitedly, she says, my husband says, I listen now. So even the skills that we get from learning coaching can immediately uh, translate into changes in our personal lives. I'll just do one quick case vignette, because I see this all the time. This is an individual who comes in and says, my knee hurts. It, it, it's stiff in the morning. I can't walk as far as I'd like to. And what I would have said to this patient, or let me sort of take you through my few pictures, and I'll give you to just as a way of framing this, how do, how would I have said this 10 years ago before I knew anything about coaching, and how would I approach the patient now, even though I'm not trained as a coach? This is my knee hurts, and we get the x-rays, and you don't have to be a doctor to say, wow, there's lots of space between the bones here in this x-ray, but this one, it's like bone on bone, loss of joint space, that's where your pain is, and Part of it is because you're carrying around a lot of extra weight here. And I can go through the physics of the multiplier effect that for every extra pound here, there's between four or six, you know, eight times that weight going through your knee every step that you take. And I could look at the guy's muscles and say, this CT cross section at the mid femur, that's the, your thigh bone there, this is a young active guy, the white stuff here is muscle. And over here, it's got the same bone pretty much but the muscle has shrunk down with age and with disuse. Um, and the rest of it is, of course, filler or fat. Um, I could say to the patient, here's what you got. You have arthritis, is what I would have done 10 years ago. We can, you know, the, the surgeon can see you, it's bone on bone. I could try to give an injection. I'm not sure I can get the needle into that tight space. Um, here's your physical therapy prescription, good luck. Um, and of course, these are some things that they can do to get their legs stronger. 
This would be they're lifting weights here. This is part of the life study. Or in this case, they're doing squats to strengthen their legs. What I, over the years, my approach has shifted markedly with what I've learned of coaching. And once again, I'm not a coach. And what I aspire to do is maybe sound like a coach. Um, in this case, the, I, we, we do the diagnosis. We say your pain is coming from that, from that uh, arthritis, from that knee there. I explain some basic physics to them about carrying the extra weight. I test their legs and basically demonstrate to them that their legs are not as strong as they should be. And then, as Radica said, I go silent. And I wait. And the average patient will, will actually say, so, if I were to get my legs stronger and actually carry around less weight, my knee would probably feel better. They've just written themselves a lifestyle prescription. The rest I have to, and I've done much less work because I learned how to be quiet. And what I do then is I, I just nod. I go, how, how would you like to proceed? And I will sit there as far as they need to go. And people will, will, will go through their own path. And they'll say, well, those exercises seem pretty doable. This is a group of impaired elders who, in a big national study, and their legs got stronger. And I guess doing the squats is going to help. You know, I, you know, why don't I go to physical therapy and learn how to do them? You know, then what, what do you want to do about eating? Well, I, I kind of know what to do. And my wife's been telling me what to do. Maybe I'll start listening. So. I've you know, sort of worked them into their own prescription. At that point, if they need some accountability, I'm likely to call in a coach. Um, I, you know, as I'm concluding here, we need to, be, to learn rudimentary coaching. Uh, doctors are not all going to become coaches. Um, you're hearing from you know, the, a couple of them uh, with Radica and Beth speaking, but we want to get the average doctor just to sort of sound like it and the more that we know about coaching, the more likely we are to refer. Another way of thinking about this is I did my rotation and was exposed to orthopedic surgery. I'm not a surgeon, but I know when to refer to them. Uh, when I refer to the coaches, largely the patients are looking for accountability. I don't have the time or the energy or the wherewithal to, to follow up with them on exactly what they're eating and, and what exercise they're doing um, as much as a coach might be able to do on a more regular basis. And goal setting is much more finely tuned. If you're, um, when you're working with coaches, and this is, I'm going to bring you back up to the present time in terms of what doctors are thinking about, we are in the very near future going to get paid based upon our patients' health behaviors. Think of those as step counts and sort of what they're eating and how much they're sleeping. The patient health outcomes. So as I mentioned, the DPP study, if indeed someone's weight is dropping, that's an outcome. If their A1Cs are less, we're going to get paid. Half of Medicare payments by 2018 are going to be based on value or outcomes rather than the way we're getting paid now for just sort of producing another widget with not a concern about what that widget actually does. And then to the shock and chagrin of many doctors, but to the opportunity for, for coaches, we're going to get paid in part based on patient satisfaction. They're going to be grading the doctors. And I'd like to put out there that if the doctor sounds like a coach, is bringing people along through a path that is sustainable, and then calls in a coach to maintain accountability, goal setting, et cetera, I, you know, we have not proven this yet, but maybe a research study for us all to do together is to show that the referral to the coaches improves patient satisfaction. The doctor is going to get paid, and that's going to improve their satisfaction. So I'm going to end there, and I think it's time for the discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you all, uh, Beth, Radhika, and Eddie. And um, we've got uh, some questions here um, gathering. And uh, please um, fill up the question space for us. We've got a nice uh, 23 minutes um, to, to do a Q&A. Um, and I want to uh, uh, follow up on um, a couple of things. Um, I'm wondering, um, as we wait for the questions to come in, I'm wondering, Radhika, one uh, comment I hear a lot is that we have, um, because of this top-down medical uh, system, where the healthcare provider, doctor, nurse knows best, um, we have taken away 
the autonomy of our patients. And we've been putting them in the passenger seat rather than in the driver's seat. Um, and often um, coaches and healthcare providers are concerned that their patients are used to being in the passenger seat now and want to be told what to do. And so I'd love for you to share just how that's worked for you um, because you went from being in charge to handing over the steering wheel. So how, how did that work and, and what would you recommend? So um, that's a very good question, Margaret. I used to think that patients wanted wanted to be told what to do, but I realized that's not the whole truth. They want to be told what to do only when they don't know what to do. But most of the time, they do know what to do. It's just that they haven't connected it with something very powerful. So one of the questions I ask them is, I, I see there's some important milestone coming up in the next six months so that the time frame is short enough to anchor. So for example, birthdays are very powerful, especially those milestones, birthdays. I see that that's coming up. Say, so um, Margaret, you have a birthday coming up in six months and you're going to be 50 at that time. What would you like your health and wellness to look like at that time? Then starts the powerful game-changing conversation. So this conversation might take me a little bit longer than the usual, okay, here's your prescription, I'll see you in three months. But this is, I consider this paying it forward because when the patient comes back next time, if the conversation went well, they already kicked me to the passenger seat and they're in the driver's seat. So that's how I handle it. That's interesting. So it, it, so it comes down to the level of self-efficacy. Yes. If the patient has... Um, some knowledge and, and confidence, then the the uh, driver's seat is a very comfortable place to sit. Absolutely, because they know you're in the passenger seat. They know that if they get off their path, you're there to guide them. Right, terrific. But, but I know more about them as a person, so they're more willing to let me sit in the passenger seat and, and be comfortable that I, I got their back no matter what. Right, interesting. Yeah, and that ties in with what Eddie said about physicians um, really adopting the mindset and, and um, presence of coaches, even yeah. if you don't have all the tools, yeah. So Beth, we have a question from um, Pamela Roberts, and it might be the Pam Roberts I know, um, um, who is also a coach, maybe not, might, I might be confusing this, but the question to you, she says, Dr. Elizabeth, do you bill for group coaching of your stroke patients using group visit codes. And I think the, the larger question here is, what's the future of group coaching? And perhaps Eddie and Radhika can say something about it, uh, that as well. So maybe, Beth, could you start and uh, talk about how you see group coaching getting paid for? OK, great. Thank you, Pamela, for the question. And I will tell you how I'm doing it currently and what we're thinking of doing in the future. Um, Right now, the Stroke Institute for Research and Recovery has funding, and they decided to put a, a significant amount of their funding into this group coaching effort for stroke survivors because there's a gap in stroke care, and it is around recovery. So at the moment, the, this pilot study is being funded uh, by the Stroke Institute, and the, patients are paying out of pocket for it, uh, about $20 a session. So it's not prohibitive, but they are paying out of pocket. You could use group coaching uh, visits. You could use shared medical appointments uh, in order to get reimbursement with insurance. That would entail having uh, certain fulfilling certain requirements like uh, doing a little bit of an exam, having some one-on-one -on -one time with a physician um, in charge if you're going to do a group visit with a physician. Right now, we're, we're hoping that uh, we can make this sustainable for Spalding and other hospitals that are interested in the very same program for stroke survivors actually around the country. Um, th that we'll be starting this in June in a research, again, in a research arena. And why we have to do this is because we're not Dean Ornish and his group, which has uh, lifestyle medicine interventions paid for by, um, by Medicare already. We're in a different uh, system in the stroke rehab, so we're, we need to prove our value first. 
um, hopefully our group visits and this type of protocol with group coaching will be covered by insurance um, soon. In the meantime, you can do these shared medical appointments or, as a lot of people are doing, it's a, a pay out of pocket for the, for the coaching session. So hopefully that helped a little bit. Pamela, perhaps um, Radhika and Eddie have something to add. Um, I, Beth, I do the diabetic group visits. So um, you're absolutely right. If we're going to build the insurance, there needs to be a little bit of an exam in there. It's a team-based uh, group visit. It's an hour and a half, and I have a dietitian as part of the group visit. But the whole concept of the group visit is based on what the patients want to learn. So they fill out a survey before the uh, start of the group visit, and the last question is, what would you like to discuss today? So my agenda is set by what they want to learn. If nobody has anything that they want to learn, then I choose the agenda. But as much as possible, I try and get the solutions out of them so that they're learning from each other. And then I supplement whatever is the missing information. But I, I do build insurance for these two visits. Edith, do you have anything that you do along these lines? Yeah, I would, I would just uh, support the idea of the shared medical appointment and the opportunity um, that some of our colleagues are doing where it's the, the main clinician, like the physician or the nurse, is running the group. They always need some help, and a coach is, uh, you know, who knows how to run the group would be well qualified to do that. So I think you're using a dietitian. There's lots of models where, where coaches are being used for that. Yes, I, I know of models, Eddie, and, uh, and, at, and all that where the um, the reimbursement for the shared medical visits, which are done um, frequently, pay for most of the salary of the coach. And the physician takes a back seat and does the physician visits with each of the people at the group visit sort of in a private room um, so people go in and out. So that, that those models are being, being developed. Um, Eddie, we've got a question from, for you from David McQuarrie who said, you spoke of buzzwords when talking about the coaches and physicians working together. What are some of those buzzwords? Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming that David means that what, what is it, what's going to provoke the physician's interest um, yes. in this? So <laughs> I, see, I, I think the, the key thing is when I speak to audiences, and uh, just last week I said, by show of hands, how many of you are going to be paid uh, is the majority of your pay going to come from patient outcomes within the next four or five years? And the only half the hands went up, and I said, everyone else, raise your hand, um, because th this is the way that we're going, both through Affordable Care uh, Act and uh, this is what Medicare is doing. So we're moving from a volume-based system to value-based, and we're right in the middle of it, and that's why it's so awkward. We've got one foot on the boat, one foot, foot on the shore, and the boat is starting to pull out. Um, the, uh, this seems to be the ideal place where coaches could come in, to, you know, and this is where you have to take the evidence that Beth presented, plus, uh, you know, actually looking behind the system, uh, the, the, the meta-analyses, to say, you know, here's the program that we can help run in your group. Uh, coaches are, you know, here's, here's the salary, here's the return on investment. Doctors do understand an ROI. Um, and that we're going to improve patient behaviors. We're going to demonstrate patient outcomes. That's the way we're going to, that's the value. And then ultimately, uh, this new one that's just coming along is patient satisfaction. And I haven't seen, and maybe Beth, you could comment if you're familiar or Margaret, whether there's any literature on patient satisfaction. But those are the kind of the, the, the buzzwords. Um, the, the other thing is it depends on who you're approaching and what the system looks like. So right now at the VA, I'm inside the largest closed system. This is population health at a $60 billion level. And the VA is famous for collecting data. And part of the challenge is to show that all of the hundreds of coaches that have been trained actually are making a difference and that the whole health program here is going to make a difference. Um, if you're working or have access to Kaiser or Permanente, they're another uh, closed system. Uh, and they're looking into this. If you're going to the average doctor, they're going to be listening for uh, the patient uh, outcome, the, the, the health outcomes that you're going to help change. Um, I'd like to add to that. There's a few questions about reimbursement and how do we get to um, the government with uh, the growing 
uh, literature base in health coaching. Um, so this is not the focus of today, and I hope there will be more to announce fairly soon. Um, but um, one of my nonprofit endeavors, in addition to the Institute of Coaching, is the National Consortium for Credentialing Health and Wellness Coaches, which has been working for six years to agree on a national standard and a national certification. And we're, we're not far from announcing, uh, the standards have been published on the website, um, but we're not far from announcing um, the, uh, the, the launch of a national credential, which then I think is the moment where we can start the conversations um, there is a there are some bills related to health coaching on Congress. They're not going to go too far in this election year, but we are raising the profile as a as a community. So, so yes, I think um, we're just at the pivotal moment when the credibility for this field crosses with the uh, huge need for engaging patients in managing their in, in being autonomous and and um, and. Uh, engaging in healthy behaviors, and so we we seem to be just getting to that moment, um, and, um, and much more to come. But I'm I'm also hopeful and optimistic that um, we will arrive on the scene with the right story and data uh, at the right moment. Um, so so stay tuned. Okay, so. Um, Oh, so just a quick question from Pam Roberts. Eddie, the New York Times article that you mentioned on the diabetes program, is that in today's New York Times? Uh, yes. Uh, okay, so maybe we can. We're just looking at the 23rd, sorry. Rob, Robert Pear wrote on uh, March 23rd. So it was yesterday. Okay, good. Um, Alan Morse asks about the ideas on how lifestyle coaching, I think you mean health and wellness coaching, gets paid for through health insurance. And I, maybe we need to just connect the dots a little further by noticing that value-based care means that the um, system or providers will be paid a lump sum to manage. Um, so there won't, it may, may never be uh, or, or a real reimbursement where a coach submits um, invoices for payment, but that the cost of the coach will be part of the system's expenses in order to d deliver value. So I hope I, does anyone want to add to that, Eddie Beth or Radhika? Um, no, I, I think if, at least in the present system, that's the way it's going to work or if if people end up doing what Beth and I are doing, which is where we have our own coaching um, business on the side, which is to help other physicians' patients. They, it's mostly um, cash pay or uh, health savings account. Those things also have been known to reimburse for something like this, if there's a doctor's prescription. Right. Good. And there is a, a, a paper being uh, published soon um, from Montana where 1,400 coaching clients are, are being referred to a medical fitness facility for um, three months of coaching. And um, in that case, um, many of the patients are paying a modest um, contribution to both the membership in the facility as well as for coaching. Um, so there's also these copay models too. Now, Jane Diamond brings up a really interesting question. Um, may not be so easy to answer, so let's just give it a try. She says, I'm currently working with a physician at a major hospital in, in uh, Philadelphia. The practice is every doc for themselves, which is having negative outcomes in patient satisfaction. Any additional insight in working with the entire practice would be appreciated. So basically, um, when you have the um, what is often the case um, in the medical world where physicians are so, solo um, entrepreneurs um, and, and working independently, how do you create this sense of collaboration um, and using coaching skills for that? Any, anybody want to take a whirl uh, with that one? Um, this is Eddie. I, I mean, one thing is that the, the, the days of solo practitioners or even small groups of like primary care doctors is, is, is definitely on the decline. Um, I hadn't really thought about this before, but if I were a health coach looking to engage, um, I probably would not go just to an individual doctor. They're probably too 
involved with just keeping the lights on and actually caring for their patients. Um, and they may not, I mean, they're struggling with, with a lot of other rules um, coming out from Medicare, et cetera. But a sort of a modest size group or something where there'll be enough patients to draw from to do like the shared medical appointments or they have the wherewithal to crunch the numbers and show that the shared medical appointment is going to pay for your salary or that there's enough doctors referring down the hallway where you're sitting or on a hotline to talk to the patient while they're in the room. Um, so I would think it's going to be more of a, a modest group. If it's a larger group, you know, sort of a, uh, they may already, uh, you, Margaret, you might have more of a sense of this, they may already have advertisements out uh, um, saying we need a, a well-qualified health coach to, here, here, here's the job, where there's certainly some examples of that. I don't know how, how fast that's spreading. Thank you. Um, Stephanie, to note, we have um, Marjorie's asked us for the link to the W, the Wall Street Journal article on Hope. I've got that one. We'll, um, I think we can. We've got all of your email addresses. We'll send out the links to both articles. The um, it was a beautiful article on Hope this week. In fact, I, I tweeted on it too. I think, or maybe just about to, um, as well as the one um, in the New York Times. Now, uh, Thomas has an interesting question uh, that I've. Uh, encountered before, um, which is, what are the ethic, some ethical issues with tying patient outcomes to the f reimbursement, the income of the health system? How will this affect the purity of the coaching? So they basically, how would the doctor's agenda, um, you know, could that in fact um, weigh down and, and take away the autonomy? Um, uh, from the coaching um, partnership. Anybody want to tackle that one? I, I mean, the, the, fir the first pushback from the average physician is to throw their hands up and roll their eyes and say, oh my gosh, I've been t telling my patients to exercise and lose weight for 30 years and no one does it. Um, and now I'm going to get paid less if they're lazy. You know, that, that's the kind of the average reaction. And we try to follow on saying, well, we are going to present the, the evidence base and the science and the experience of many others that if you approach this differently and have a different skill set yourself, a different mentality, kind of like what Radhika talked about, a less stressful way of practicing, and you enjoin yourself with the appropriately trained colleagues, that would be the health coaches, that is, you're actually going to do fine and your patients are going to be healthier and like, why did you become a doctor in the first place? If you go back and read people's admission uh, essays, they all want to improve health. It's, um, and they end up treating sickness. Um, the ethics of it is a really interesting question. Um, I, I don't know that I would be conflicted on what I'm telling or how I'm negotiating with the, with the patient, although any professional should disclose, whether you're a financial professional or a lawyer or a doctor, um, how you're getting paid, and that's a really interesting question um, to to take a look at. You know, are doctors now obligated to say, "Hey, by the way, I'm getting paid on your on your waist girth"? So let's, uh, uh, you know, like I I haven't come across that yet, but uh, we're we're there, we're we're right there. That's interesting. What I was where I was thinking, Eddie, this would go is that the physicians may, in fact be more enforcing medication compliance and giving up on the lifestyle medicine, which might, so, so you went, immediately went to the lifestyle medicines as the thing that you wanted people to engage with. Do you think that that is a, the, the state of mind for physicians today, that they are more, they see the, that, that the lifestyle medicines are in fact more important than the regular medicines, than the well, medical medicines? Yeah, I mean, in, in, in the world that Radhika, Beth, and I live in, sure. But, uh, you know, the word is not yet out to the vast majority of doctors about exactly what lifestyle medicine, you know, give us a, we're, we're making progress, but we're not, we're not there yet. So I think, um, interest, I'll just bring up one point you brought up is that are we going to be pushing medication compliance better? I include that within lifestyle medicine. And, uh, you know, another quick anecdote I could tell you is that when a patient comes to me and their blood pressure is out of control and, and they agree to walk a little further, carry their lunch twice a day, and actually take the medicines. You know, I, I kind of joke with them, not too sarcastically, that 
studies show that the medicines that you put in your mouth work better than the ones that you keep in the bottle. Um, the medicines are effective, but only something like half of all prescriptions are filled and taken as the doctor, rec doctor or nurse practitioner recommended. So uh, an, an easy sort of low-hanging fruit in lifestyle medicine is, you know, take the medicine, lower your blood pressure, take care of your blood sugars, buy yourself some time so that now we can do the stuff that is going to sustain you, like the, you know, the more the lifestyle interventions. So I, I, don't, I don't separate them, and I'll be really clear that this is not an anti-pharmaceutical uh, mission on any part. In fact, we're more likely to prescribe like a nicotine um, uh, uh, treatment for someone who's trying to quit smoking. That would be a new medication. Um, so I think I, I apply, I think my ability to get patients to actually take the medicines has been vastly improved by what I've learned from coaching. And that might be a really early, easy entree for many physicians to understand also. Yeah, that's a great point, Eddie. And I think um, in my review of the literature, there are coaching interventions that hit on medication of clients, uh, compliance in particular. I would also point out there's recent literature about exercise prescription, in fact, comparing it to drugs and medications in terms of its efficacy. And there's one in the British Journal of Sports Medicine from 2015. It's volume 49, um, and uh, the author is NACI, N-A-C-I, if you're interested in this topic. And it could be helpful for physicians and also health coaches in terms of connecting together and partnering with the patient to show them that if indeed you do get the recommended levels of physical activity exercise in 150 minutes a week, you could decrease that blood pressure even more effectively than the pill. So I think that that's another way to, to look at it. I agree with Eddie. We have we, a, a compliance and, and having people take their medications is critical. And then swaying them, like he said, buying time, swaying them towards the use of exercise and stress reduction uh, and being aware of this literature perhaps if you're a health coach and also a physician to utilize with the, the patient. I wanted to go briefly back to David's point and uh, 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 add to the excellent conversation which is the buzzwords. I think that our love and passion for behavior change is not necessarily shared by all physicians. And as Radhika mentioned before, her co-training, and, and Eddie has talked about, many many physicians have a, a view that this is just really hard. No one listens to me. I can't do this. The patients aren't doing it. It's, it's their fault. Or a, a view that is not the same as ours in, in the field of lifestyle medicine and health and wellness coaching. So one big buzzword is saying to physicians or other people you want to collaborate with is, I love talking to patients about diet and exercise and working with them to improve their healthy habits. It's really, it's really fun for me. It's a passion for me and I love spending the time on it because a lot of other people aren't the same as we are and they would really like to hand the baton in this team effort. They would like to hand the baton to you. So if you can convey your enthusiasm and love for this behavior change process, I think that will also help you in terms of these buzz words. Um, and then really I think the water that is uh, in the vase that's allowing us to survive as a bouquet together is our self-care. And we didn't touch on that too much. Uh, Radhika did mention her life is better uh, now, uh, and her counseling is, is it sounds like, um, perhaps more fun now than it was before. But that water and that base, that self-care that's going to allow us all to remain in this bouquet is, I believe, really, really critical. So coaching physicians and ourselves, uh, lifestyle medicine practitioners and coaches, too, keep our level of wellness high and to enable each other to practice uh, routine exercise, healthy diet, stress reduction is another key piece to this healthcare transformation. Um, many articles and over many years have shown that if physicians 
practice what they uh, preach, uh, they're actually more likely to, to, to preach it. Um, they, so if they exercise, they're more likely to counsel on exercise. Um, uh. So, so Beth, there was a question about one of your studies that I wanted to not leave without addressing. You talked about a, a coach, a, a physician in primary care getting yeah. coached, and I wasn't clear was the physician being coached on the physician's personal wellness or on what being trained to coach patients? Yeah, good point. I'm glad you're clarifying that. So that is, the physician was acting as a coach working with other primary care physicians, helping them, helping the primary care physicians to counsel the patients so that they would lower their levels of hemoglobin A1C, the patients would. Okay, so it was a physician as coach. Okay, good. And so then that brings, I think we've got time for one last, um, I'm going to put two questions together, um, which has to do with, uh, let me see, maybe it's three questions together. Um, has to do with what will happen with um, primary care and coaches. Um, so, uh, and Matt, maybe Radhika, we can start with you because you are in primary care. So, I'll put them all together. So, first, do you see health coaches becoming a standard part of the primary team, team care team practice? And and um, and if you were to refer to wellness coach, are you from what? You know, what do you think the compliance would be um, in that scenario? Um, actually, I think I think what I'm doing right now is a combination of both. I have my part-time job as an employed physician of assistant, but I have a small um, coaching business on the side, and I partner with a fellow internist. And she has a very busy practice, and she's equally passionate about um, making patients move to the driver's seat, but she doesn't have the time to have the conversations, nor is she interested in the training. So it's a win-win combination because I get to put on my wellness doctor's hat only and have those coaching conversations with them, and together we're empowering the patients to their best self. So what she, the feedback that I got from her is she refers most of them because they're overweight, they need to lose weight or whatever, but her um, in her take on their improvement is, Radhika, you know, they seem so much happier. They seem so much more self-confident that they can do this. So I think that is a wonderful first step towards progression to wellness. And there are hospitals in the community, at least one hospital that I know of, that has coaching as coaches available to the PCPs groups. Good. So you see that being, I mean, you're kind of on the front line making that happen, and I think that speaks to the fact that this is still a new phenomenon. Yes. Um, and I just want to wrap up on that point, that if you go back to the March coaching report, we featured a research paper this month by uh, Bodenheimer, who's a, a veteran um, uh, researcher in um, coaching and peer coaching. And they showed that that when patients work with health coaches, the quality of the patient visits with the physician improves. Um, it's much less work. They get more accomplished. Um, so more literature to come on that front. So with that, we're just an, a minute after our um, closing time. So I just like to say a wonderful uh, thank you. Express my gratitude for our three doctors who are very all very busy and have taken out prime time on a Thursday to be with us. Um, and we hope that this is the beginning of m many, many more conversations that all together, you all out there and us here, uh, we're all together, we're going to move this, this whole uh, conversation and potential forward so that the spring will bloom and we'll get the full harvest. So with that, as I like to say, onward and upward all. And um, we'll uh, hopefully connect with you one way or another very soon. Thank you, Margaret. Thank, Thank you, Eddie. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you. Mm -hmm.